So uh, great to have you all here. Uh, we have a um, yeah, fantastic lineup um, today with us. We talk about venture capital in the Web3 space, also some of the differences between Web2, uh, Web3, Web3, venture capital. And we see a lot of momentum right now. So a lot of the Web2 funds are leveling up on Web3. Um, for example, of course, Andreas Horowitz, Cherry also in Germany, and new funds are approaching the scene. Uh, because there's a lot of uh, building happening right now and a lot of uh, stuff that's coming up, new technologies and so on. You all know about that. And hopefully today we get a glimpse from some of the experts today to get a better feeling of what Web3 venture capital is all about and also some of the differences between the Web2 venture capital and Web3 venture capital. So please uh, welcome on stage, first of all, Daniel Höpfner. Daniel is a tech entrepreneur turned investor. He founded Deep Blue X, focusing on crypto and Web3 investments. And before that, he was also already investor with B10 in the Web2 space, where he invested in category killers. Welcome on stage, Daniel. Thank you very much. <laughs> Then we have Sara Gottwald with us. She's a venture capitalist at Crypto Finance VC, also focusing on the crypto and Web3 ecosystem, investing there, and also supporting um, and mentoring female talents in the Web3 space um, <clears throat> with the HER, the Her DAO. Before that, she worked a lot in the corporate world with BMW, investing in startups and also doing a lot of mergers and acquisition deals. Welcome on stage, Sarah. And next up, Laudens, Laudens Abiadios from Blockwall. Blockwall also uh, already a little bit longer in this space, actually. So we're a pretty well-known leading European blockchain investor and also advisor to the Singularity Group. And I don't know about your schedule, actually. You're also an executive director of two family businesses. So there a lot of stuff, stuff comes together. Actually, welcome. There's a lot of stuff. Thank you. <laughs> And last but not least, Felix Eiser from the Wave3 Fund, founder and partner of the Wave3 Fund. Um, before that, he founded Riku Helton, and which was sold to Stir. And since then, he built up a unique uh, business angel portfolio. Every VC probably, um, yeah, would love to have. Welcome, Sage. Thank you. So perfect. The Crypto winter is here right now. And I think um, for all of you guys who are raising capital or also are looking for funding right now, you all experience that the times changed from the end of 2021, the beginning, beginning 2022. And it would be interesting to hear from you guys, um, what's your current take on, on the Web3 state right now, especially with a venture capital perspective and where you see maybe currently also opportunities in this area. Lawrence, would you like to, to start off with the first question and your thoughts on that? Sure. So as an investor in this space, we've seen this period for the third time now. So it's nothing new. It's just a bit colder, a bit longer here and there. But at the core points always stay the same. What we do is look for innovation. And when there is a bull market, innovation can be quite blurry because a lot of stuff that shouldn't receive money is getting too much money. So the really good stuff is more difficult to find. Whilst in these days, you still meet the same brilliant entrepreneurs, developers that are building stuff, but the arrogancy and the blurriness is going down and so do valuations. And as an investor, you not only need to find the good stuff, but you need to buy it at a good price because the return is made from uh, the point of entry. So it's a bit of both. So in, in essence, um, I feel that times like these are very good in general to sort of... Um, clear the market of stuff that shouldn't have received money in the first place. Uh, it's a bit controversial because the more money is being poured in something, there will be something coming out of it, but you don't want to be invested in all of it. So the job at the end of the day remains the same. Find the good stuff at a good price and be happy and wait. Maybe, maybe I can add something because you just talked about value and valuation. And I think this is something really important because it belongs together, but it's not the same. So valuation is justified by the value behind. And I think this is something really important if you start investing. And maybe I want to make a very quick example. So if you want to buy a flat in Munich and it's like 50 square meters and the value of the flat is like half a million. If you can buy the, value, the flat for 200K, it's amazing and you should definitely go for it. If you can buy it for half a million, then the valuation is equal to the value. 
But if if the owner wants to have like I don't know two million, then it's definitely definitely way too expensive. And so if you have a flat, it's really easy because you have historical data and you com can compare it. But if you come to startups and especially startups in the Web3 space, this is so difficult because we don't have historical data. The market is evolving, changing. There are so many new technologies coming up. So it's really, really difficult to compare startups and to find the real value behind because the valuation can be 1 million or 200 million. Both can be fine if the value behind is fitting. And especially for us, we are investing in seed and pre-seed. And this is like the most unpredictable area and so, yeah, it's, this is our job to find the real value behind evaluation. And I think this is one of our yeah, biggest challenges. Do you see there a specific field right now that's, that's hot uh, in the field? We see, especially because it's crypto winter kind of right now. Anything where you see like this, there's a lot of building, there's a lot of an area where you like to invest, especially? So I can take this. So it doesn't really matter what kind of market you have. It really depends on what kind of use cases do make sense in the first place. And then no matter where the market is, how capable is the team to match the, the, cap the, the opportunity that a business case can provide with a market that's there and actually um, target an, an audience that's at the end of the day going to use it. Because if you have blurriness with a bull market, there's a lot of expectation into a project that may never be, be fulfilled. So at the end of the day, the market in that sense doesn't, doesn't change things. So what are the topics that are interesting? That is, for example, decentralized finance as one of the more tangible use cases that are out there. And then NFTs, for example, are also a good use case. I'm not talking about monkey pictures in, uh, in particular, but the fact that you have a digital certificate and what it can be used for has been around for five years, but it's now starting to be, become a bit more tangible. So if you dissect what the technology can do and what a use case is, you'll see where the trends are going and also where the capabilities of the market and the technology lies on a time frame. Yeah, and the, the other area, which was also pretty interesting, is the whole um, as rege regenerated finance means where we are healing the planet somehow, yeah, and um, the, the um, carbon certificate management and carbon certificate trading via crypto. This is an area where we are looking into in the moment. So I, I wanted to say exactly the same. So regenerated finance or everything around carbon credits. Felix, I've heard you invested in Senken as well. So we did invest in Senken as well. So they put uh, carbon credits on the blockchain, so on-chain. And yesterday I read an article that Salesforce is going in that market now as well. Um, as far as I understood, it's not on-chain, but so the big tech companies entering that market now as well. And I think ReFi is amazing because you have like two different kind of people. You have the classical finance guy because it's regenerative finance. But you also have the people who really take care about the environment and really want to bring an impact. And um, so you can compare finance and nature. And I think we all want to live like the next several years on the earth. And I think, yeah, for our children as well. So I think regenerative finance is something really, really interesting. And we can bring a lot of innovation with blockchain to that market. Okay. I mean, we also have, of course, not only crypto winter, but a hard economy right now and uh, climate change and so on. So there are several topics. Are there different um, approaches for a Web3 VC to all of this compared to a Web2 VC? Are there challenges um, that uh, maybe Web3 is facing or Web2 is facing that one of the others has different perspective, different knowledge, different background, different skill set also that can bring to the table? Um, where see differences and opportunities? Maybe Felix? So what we see are a couple of differences. Um, obviously, Web3 companies are earlier in stage. So we invest in pre-seed seed. So um, usually you cannot judge companies by their unit economics or revenues, anything like that. That would be applicable with the Web2 companies. So it's more about the, the vision of where it can go. What we see as a difference also is more party rounds, I would say, like VCs working together, chipping in. It's, what we don't usually see is like one VC taking over the whole round and kicking everybody else out. And uh, this is an interesting structure that I've seen that I really like and is more collaborative 
environment. And I see that especially in Web3. Uh, and one thing that's also different between Web2 and Web3 investing is the question of what you're actually investing into, right? Because in Web2, you have equity, and equity is always the same, right? In Web3, you sometimes have equity, sometimes have tokens, sometimes have equity with the call option for tokens and all of that. And you have to, first of all, figure out what you're actually investing uh, to, right? Because also token designs can be quite tricky. And the question is, where does the value actually accrue? Does it accrue in a, in a centralized entity or does it accrue in the token somehow? So you have to figure that out first and find out what you're actually um, investing to and have, an, have to have an open eye for that. And if I can add to that, there's a beautiful thing about crypto investing, which is that you, you can invest in pre-seed seed and within 12 to 18 months, you will have a liquid token that's out there that has a trading price with a lot of volatility, which means nothing but... A lot of people think different things about this token and uh, think of Facebook two years into after its founding and you, you would have a share price and people trade around it. There's really nothing tangible to, to manifest a, a share price and the same with tokens. So as an investor, you can still buy into early stage opportunities while they're already trading. And at the same time, one, if you already are invested, as an investor, you have another fiduciary duty, which is to protect your investors' capital that have invested into your fund. So what you can also do whilst you're doing these early stage investments is you can hedge yourself. You can short the market because there is a lot of volatility. You can protect uh, the dollar or euro value. It doesn't matter. Uh, it depends on how you're denominated as a fund. But you can set yourself up for whatever market circumstance there is. If markets are just going up, there's no need to hedge yourself. But if the markets are where they are and there's no outlook that they may change any, any second day or month soon, you can protect this, uh, you, you, your portfolio and at the same time still be very active and invest in innovation at early stages. So there's a beautiful opportunity that, as far as I have seen, is not that easily possible in the classical venture capital world because you're typically stuck in an equity investment begging, hoping for an IPO or trade sale, and the IPO market is dead these days, and trade sales are being done at lower valuation. So the market for the classical equity investments with an exit are not as um, beautiful as they were uh, one or two years ago. And I think the market is a lot, like you already said, the market is a lot more scalable than before because there's not a lot of hardware needed. Most everything is like software and online. So the startups can, can scale very, very fast. And so even from an investor perspective, even if you do an equity investment, you invest in something and normally it takes a lot more time, more years to, to go through the building of process, a process of building. But uh, in, in our environment, things are so much faster. And I think even the exits might be faster as well. Does this also mean you have a different um, limited partner structure maybe in the funds? Because the funds are a little bit different structured in the end. It's not that long term. It's more liquid, maybe more like a secondary environment possible. And so, um, also the, the VC funds, I don't know how your fund are structured, but our fund, you still have um, limited partner. Um, you still you typically have 10, 20 um, um, investors in your fund. Um, what is different this is the second part. Um, you are pr um, pretty uh, fast on the return side. Yeah? The, if you want, yeah? then you are able to um, exit your investment um, after the token is issued within maybe two, three, four years compared to eight or ten years, yeah? which is in the Web2 uh, world, the typical time frame where you have to invest and to wait uh, and to support the startup that um, they are realizing the exit. And um, this is in value. And um, from LP side, I don't know what's your take. Um, and from our side, this is the same. So we're just raising our funds, so I can tell you more about that in like half a year or a year. But so far from the talks we had, um, we see um, many more entrepreneurial LPs that are entrepreneurs themselves or like entrepreneurial family offices that like to invest into innovative technology, right? Because Web3 is so very new for a lot of uh, people and what they want to do is they want to invest into the asset class but also learn about the space so basically invest to educate uh, themselves and get exposure to the whole ecosystem and this is all also one of the reasons why we host uh, these events and community events and publish a podcast and all of that to educate more people about the asset class but this kind of interest um, is i think pretty unique with rep3 um, funds 
I 100% agree. And there's another level that's also coming to digital assets, which is uh, proper institutional investors. So they have been interested in this for many years. And they, since the beginning of this year, they've started to actively look for managers, so funds that are covering this, whether it's a trading fund, a metaverse fund, a long fund, a market neutral fund, it doesn't matter. So the institutional, the institutional asset managers are allocating to this, do that for the uncorrelated characteristics it typically has, uh, and therefore they're looking for structures and managers that can fulfill that. And we, for example, we're an evergreen structure, so the investors that invest with us, they, they can hold that position for many, many years, and we, on the flip side, are not um, forced to sell our positions um, after a few years, but we can even increase it over time because we can have continuous money inflows. And why I'm saying that is there's so many varieties how investments are done, what motivations are, are out there to buy something and sell something. And that's something that's reflected starting now with institutions that are saying like digital assets is going to be here. I don't know how, but I think there's a few smart people on this um, bench that are trying to figure this out and I'm allocating some risk on uh, capital to be part of that. And in particular on the learning mode and definitely on a much, much uh, steeper growing curve that many would expect in uh, Europe, for example. Now we talked a little bit about the, the LP uh, side. You mentioned a lot of um, like the big words, like Metaverse and uh, Web3, a lot of technologies come together. Does this change also something as a VC? Because the business models are much more broader, much complexer, maybe also the skill sets to evaluate the business models uh, behind it are much, much more complex because completely different markets uh, you're talking about here, right? Maybe I can start with this because I, I just I was at the Borderless conference in Berlin and there was a guy uh, talking about he, he made a speech and I think this was something really really interesting because from my point of view maybe the others can add later not so much has changed yet mm -hmm. but um, our way we invest is still from from certain things is still similar. I mean, we have still the investment phase from pre seed to seed to Series A. We do we do a due diligence. We make a contract. We negotiate. But that guy, he gave a speech and he said that he wants to bring the investment process on chain, so on the blockchain. And he said that you um, you can get a token, and with a token you have the right to exchange the token into a share of GmbH, and then you don't need to go to the notary anymore. And the process is a lot more transparent because then you don't have negotiations 101, but it's everything is, you can see everything on the blockchain. And um, yeah, I, I can't explain in detail, but I just heard that speech. And I think this is something really, really interesting because until now, my job was similar to, uh, to what we did with Web2. So from the process here. But if something like this is coming, our uh, way we are working will change a lot because at the moment we invest in startups that, in, that in, do it or change like finance industry or refi or whatever but our industry didn't from the process side didn't change that much but that would be something yeah very very interesting I guess and yeah I'm, I'm, I wrote him because I'm really curious about getting to know more about that idea I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, it's, it's ironic, right, that we invest in Web3 startups and still have to go to the notary and have the paper read out and all. So, yeah. I mean, a couple of the companies we invested in today accepted stablecoins, and I think that's uh, more common with DAOs uh, to invest in, right? So I think that's going to pick up, and I think the tools that will be there in a couple of years to make the investments completely um, digital. But we, um, looking at the business model of a VC in the LP base, um, for example, we do things a bit uh, differently in our structure. So, for example, the team we assembled um, is a team of Web2 builders, and we all have the company sold them, so typical entrepreneurial track record. But we teamed up with three, I would call them Web3 natives. So they're 10 years younger than us, right? And uh, they basically grew up in Discord and analyzed the Twitter communities and all of that. So they're much younger, much more into the scene. And this is like one thing we would like to bring to the table that we have those two generations uh, basically in uh, the fund. And another thing um, is the, the community and media part, basically, that uh, we offer. And I think that's quite unique in the fund is to, to invest money, but also be very active in the community and produce content and all around that. And we do that for a reason. We do that for the reason to support the founders, right? Because there are rounds where everybody can invest into. 
those rounds are not the most interesting ones. The, the most interesting rounds are the ones you cannot get into and you have to have a reason to, to get into uh, that. And this is why we do all those uh, things to be able to um, add value on top of the, the money. And I think things like that are going to be more common that VCs challenge their own business models, maybe tokenize their funds, maybe combine media and investing, maybe do some completely different things. So really looking forward for some innovation in the VC space because that has not been happening in the last 10, 20 years. So the structure of VCs is still the same, right? And, and, and there's a good reason for that, to be honest, because the funds need a certain regulatory level for, in particular professional investors and institutional investors to deploy money into. I mean, we've, we're now at the third fund generation and we've had a steep learning curve of what is actually necessary on a structural level for money to flow into us. This is the one side. The other side is where do we deploy into? And we've learned that we needed to separate equity investments, so investments in startups from investments in token. And I hate the equity part, which is why I'm not operationally active on the equity part, because it's exactly that. You're discussing contracts, you, talk, you have to go to the notary, and you spend three hours reading a contract that you've read three times before with your lawyers, and it's a nasty process. So that is doomed to be innovated at some point. On the token side, the code itself gives you a lot of content and detail and finitive uh, clarity on what the end result can be. On a, on a parameter level. So you know exactly if there's X token available and the business model is Y, and if I buy Z percent of that network, I know exactly how much I will have and I can work together with the founders towards achieving that goal and thereby I accrue value over time. And the investment process is exclusively with stable coins, so no bank transfer, nothing. It is so much smoother and quicker, which also re results into many projects receiving funding. Again, what I mentioned earlier, that should not have received funding in the first place. So it's a, it's a give and take, but the process is clearly towards innovation and more, more effective money deployment in innovation, into innovation than it's been in, in classic VC investments. Yeah, and one, um, one point to add, um, because you asked what has changed on the VC side, um, um, my perspective also the, the diligence percent changed a little bit in this direction that um, um, there are uh, half of the projects have no business case in the beginning. Yeah, um, they are pretty tech driven or protocol driven, and um, you have to have a better understanding of the technology. And which comes also uh, um, um, on the table is. Um, how the founders are connected in the community. Mm -hmm. To be honest, it was a part which um, in the first fund in B10, we are really not really uh, into it. As we, sure, we did, uh, took a look on, um, do they have a LinkedIn profile, but that's it. Today, you are really uh, going into how old is the social media profile, how they act and behave on, in Discord or on Twitter. Do they have a public GitHub repository? How they communicate with other de developers in the community? And this was really also new for us to learn that, yeah. Because in the beginning, as it was, one was business case, second was what's the idea and the pitch deck, third was what is the product and the tech, and now you are wiping out, not always. I'm a little bit accelerating. You're wiping out the business case and focusing on the team and social community aspect of the founders. And this is um, this is a huge difference. And this is also interesting for founders because you have to build up your your your, your social media footprint um, over the time. As it's not enough that you coming out of the idea um, out of stealth mode or, or, or um, out of the university with an idea and say, okay, uh, the day after I have a Twitter profile and then Discord and GitHub, you have to develop it over time. That it's also um, really um, some trustworthy. And I think what Felix mentioned to kind of join forces, right? So the, the Web2 builders and the Web3 natives in the end, uh, are you also leveling up? Do you see a need for this? Is this maybe the secret sauce for Web3 uh, venture capital? I, I totally agree. And that's best practice. If you, if you look at a crypto project, it's per se a global product. So the teams also know that if I have support, not only money, but physical brain support from all over the world, the chances of that product to be spread in parallel on a global basis are much, much higher. So we see that and we proactively support that in all of our early investments that we curate the round. So we support the teams just to tell them like, 
in each of the to have that investor on board or that investor for that particular reason. And for a subsequent round, we have the billion dollar crypto funds in our network that will jump in when it's sizable for them to jump in because in seed rounds, pre-seed rounds, they don't typically write tickets, but in later rounds they do. So it is a give and take, and it's a, it's a very strong and very collaborative community, but I would argue that it's getting more competitive because there's more money being deployed into that. So I would truly wonder how long that a status quo will remain or whether there's like investor communities being formed where there's a certain group co-investing and there's other groups co-investing and those groups are sort of competing around uh, early stage deals. Yeah, and I think especially between the VCs, there is given and taken as well at the moment. So people, so uh, I think the connections are really um, close because there are not so many VCs at the moment in that space. And so people are really connecting. And like we said, due diligence in this phase is really challenging. And so it also helps if we, as we see, talk to each other, trying to uh, put our minds together, helping with ideas, helping with knowledge. And this is something uh, I really enjoy because this feels like um, finding the right startups all over together and then supporting them with all our knowledge. So uh, we have a few more minutes left, actually. And we have a lot of builders probably also here in, in the crowd. Um, what are your current hot topics you are investing in? So that after also our talk, they know exactly they have to go to each one of you with a specific approach or business model. What's the hottest topic you're investing right now? Okay. Everybody so, has to say something. So. Yeah, well, I think I already talked about refi, so I don't want to do that again. So this is one of the parts. And the second part is we really want to give users and creators the power back over the internet, so over their own data, and things that really help to, yeah, future work-related topics. Um, so this is something important to us because I, I want to make an example. I talk to many people and very often people say like, oh, people don't care about privacy. And I think this is totally wrong. I think people do care about privacy, but in Web2, sometimes this is so hard because I, either you are totally out of a certain system, you can't use some things if you really care about your privacy. So either you exclude yourself um, or it's sometimes, sometimes it's really difficult to really care about privacy. Um, or you can't, yeah, you exclude yourself or you, you have to give your data away. And I think with Web3, those things can change a lot. So everything around that is really important to us because I would definitely say the vast majority of people would always consider privacy if it's easy for them. So it must be easily usable. So, and everything future work related, like bringing ASOP shares for shares for employees, for example, to the blockchain, um, or getting paid uh, in crypto anyhow. So those things, this is like the second part. And the thir third part is uh, like, I would say classical financing things like banking, because uh, everything around banking is still very slow. It takes a lot of energy and it's very intransparent. So we would like to bring or invest in startups um, that yeah, bring the um, investment process, the banking system to a higher level. And for example, also like financial inclusion is a topic. Still, people all don't have access to finan financial, financial bank systems all over the world. So this is something important. So... Yeah, those three things are, this is what we are focusing on. Um, refi we had already, yeah, we don't touch it anymore. Second one for us is the whole um, SME area. Uh, um, in the moment, um, it's mainly driven from, from um, end users, the whole crypto um, scene, end users, and pretty huge player. But the whole German middle stand, how you call it, um, is, is missed out. And this would be pretty interesting to bring the German middle stand into this whole crypto, web free, DeFi, finance um, um, space. Because it's huge, yeah, and um, end of the day, um, we are looking for interesting use cases um, to enable these middle stand, um, middle stand player. And um, the third one is, in the last years, uh, we, um, we saw a lot of development in protocols and technology enabler. The next step would be, yeah, real use cases, how you use it, and to make it easier for end user. Yeah, in the moment, um, as if you're using um, some DeFi protocol, 
Um, also, you have to use a MetaMask, you have to use as a different um, different step before you can use a service. It's too difficult, too complicated. It's not end user friendly. It means everything which is um, um, make it more easier. Um, we are happy to see it. So, the, for for us, there's really two things that make us excited. One is if if it's very technical. So, for example, if you build a protocol that actually provides reliable speed to uh, blockchains so that they can actually compete with NASDAQ. We're slowly seeing that developments happening. We've done a few investments and this really excites us to really bring this technology to a level that is competitive out there and not clumsy and slow or with off, um, off takes. And the other side is really applications that make a lot of sense. One example just announced around today, which is uh, an online chess game that brings millions of people to playing chess uh, and they're earning money with that. There's an NFT component to it because you own your chess figures and it's a, and they've signed up. Well, what's the name of it? Immortal, Immortal Game. And they've signed up uh, 50 of the chess masters worldwide. And this is a sudden thing that will bring millions of people to this. And no one cares whether there's a crypto blockchain component to it or not. And that's the real point. The technology is a back-end um, innovation, and it does not does not need to be uh, on the front side of any marketing material, but it should power it. And this is really where we need to see an impact of a use case that actually creates cash flows on a token basis, M more like uh, a company, but way more effective. Wow, I love the chess game. I play so much chess at this point. I could make money off that. Sounds amazing. So. Um, we invest more in the application side, so we think a lot of the infrastructure is being built out and we see the next wave of innovation happening in an end-user application. So this is what we're focused on in, uh, investing in. A couple of things we're interested in is digital fashion. Mentioned a couple of those examples, so we'd love to make another investment um, there. Um, very interested in NFT ticketing, so everything like concerts, sports games, all of that, combining NFTs with real-world access. So that's an area we're very interested in. And the third one would be tokenization of assets um, that have not been done before. So for example, if you invest in a company where you can invest in athletes, right? And you can own part of their earnings. And that's super interesting. And I think you can do that in other categories. Uh, tokenization of art, tokenization of real estate, um, tokenization of all cars, like real world assets. So I think that's an exciting area for us. Okay, if we have builders now in the crowd, maybe one sentence from everybody. What is the most important thing also in Web3 space that you can like share your wisdom that you get funding? Um, you have to solve a real problem. Yeah, I think the most important team, uh, the most important thing is the team. So how? What do, yeah, everything around the team. So what's their spirit? What the vision? What the mission? Do they believe in the project? How are they focused? Like, are they working there full time? And is it something that can he bring or he or she bring the spirit to me that I really believe that he is fully committed and that um, he really thought through everything? Maybe a quick follow-up question to, to both but what you just said. I think these are really two major uh, issues kind of or might be major issues because first of all solve a real problem you mentioned German Mittelstand right uh, you have to get there your wallet shouldn't be visible more or less at all technology is an important thing behind it and um, but also um, maybe your experiences so you, you can share your wisdom later on we have uh, one and a half more minutes um, but um, uh, regarding the team and it's completely all over the world spread and they have several projects sometimes right so What's your experience there? Does this, is it really this a make or break deal? For me, it probably would be a make or break deal if they are shared all over the place, doing three projects uh, at the same time. And um, yeah. Um, in B10, it was a deal breaker. Um, there was our focus that um, the team is together. And to be honest, also in B10, that um, the team is at least in Germany. Um, but now, um, since COVID and with the three, it doesn't matter anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Can go on, share your wisdom. <laughs> Very quickly, just don't be arrogant and be able to transport your conviction into what you're, de in, in what you're doing so that I'm convicted as well. 
And I would just add, be precise in the communication, right? Because the space is new and there's so many buzzwords floating around. Don't hide behind them. Don't hide behind a 30-page white paper. Uh, be proper in what you communicate to actually solve a problem. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope uh, the audience uh, learned something was an entertaining discussion. Um, it's a wrap and we see each other in roughly an hour at the bar. Well, friends of Meta Brew.